Here we are um, engaging in Dharma practice, putting effort in our spiritual practice. And uh, not only are we engaging in um, any type of Dharma, we're engaging in the great uh, Mahayana vehicle, uh, the Bodhisattva vehicle. And within the Mahayana vehicle, there is um, the Sutra teachings as well as the Tantric teachings. And here in this context, our practice is associated with uh, the Tantric uh, vehicle. And so, because our practice is associated with the tantras, it is absolutely uh, essential to have the basis in the sutra, in the sutric teachings. And so, this means that the essence of the path which is indicated in the sutras must be combined. And this is um, the essence truly is uh, renunciation, bodhicitta, and emptiness. <clears throat> And so these are really the essence of this uh, sutra, this sutric spiritual path, which is presented in the text of uh, Lama Tsongkhapa, the three principal aspects of the path. Um, the Lam Rim really shows us the importance of a uh, refuge and bodhicitta, and these are also essential components in our practice of deity yoga, the foundation of all good qualities present to us like a, a panoramic view of the path and also all of the benefits which we um, which will come about by engaging in such practices. So it becomes actually a common ground while we're engaging in the tantric teachings. There are these common paths which must be followed with the sutra, uh, <coughs> the sutric practices, and this is very important to bear in mind. Training and studying this path is very important. <laughs> Tower, <laughs> <laughs> 
Whether we talk about this a common path of practice or we discuss, uh, we can call it just simply the Lam Rim, uh, these are really uh, practices which enable a training of the course, a level of mind. Um, and our, um, the Tantras really are uh, engaging a much more subtle uh, level of our mind. And therefore, it really requires that our practice combines both, both of these dimensions. So practices associated with the Sutras as well as with the Tantras. The Sutras purpose is truly to pacify our course level of mind, uh, reach a certain level of stability and peace on a course level, on a grosser level of mind. And then the Tantra as focus is really to ripen the most subtle mind which is uh, present within us. And um, a ma uh, an individual is composed of both of these um, sort of types of mind, one could say, these different levels of mind, one being coarse, one being much more subtle, and the coarse one requires purification and training to get any type of access to the more subtle level of mind, and so the subtle mind, which will be um, harnessed in the tantric practices, will um, enable not only a ripening of this most subtle mind, but also an igniting of its uh, power and a sort of, um, yeah, igniting of its capacity. When we consider the trainings and the teachings presented within uh, the Lam Rim, within the graduated path to enlightenment, there are trainings which are uh, done in sort of two dimensions. One of them would be the method side, the other one would be wisdom. And so while these two practices uh, both exist, they are done in a sort of sequential manner. Uh, it's kind of like we're developing one mind associated with a method and one mind associated with wisdom. They're quite distinct states of mind in a way. The practice that we engage in in the context of the Lam Rim, in the Sutra teachings, um, we notice that the, the main mind which is used is the coarse uh, level of mind, or coarser level of mind. And so it is this coarse mind which engages in dualistic appearances and in, which requires uh, being pacified, which reply, requires being subdued in a sense. And so the way to subdue such a coarse mind, um, sort of uh, with, which is focusing or obsessing in a sense over dualistic appearance is done by uh, meditating and uh, training in uh, wisdom and method. So these two minds, these two states of mind of wisdom and method enable a healing of this course level of mind. 
In the Tantra teachings, a method and wisdom are not presented in distinct manners. It's really one mind which is training in both. And so this capacity to have one mind which is training in both of these aspects enables to overcome this belief in a du in dualistic existence. Uh, um, and so dualistic appearances and uh, the belief in dualistic uh, reality are wiped out and subsided through this training in this, um, this single mind training in both of these aspects. <laughs> Nowadays we talk about two in one. <laughs> so, so Tantra is like two in one, basically. What do you think? <laughs> so usually sutra is like I said that these separate minds of method and wisdom and so tantra is really two in one you're doing uh, both of those with one single mind Um, when we consider uh, the mind and the ordinary mind, how um, in an ordinary fashion it tends to engage in a very coarse manner and therefore has a very dualistic way of engaging with the external world. And so this is why because of this coarse mind having this uh, habit in a sense of engaging in a dualistic manner, in the sutra tradition, method and wisdom are presented a very distinct kind of elements to practice the spiritual path. On the other hand, uh, in the tantras, the main ob obstacle to these practices is the dualistic mind itself. And therefore, this is why in such a tradition, the method and wisdom are presented really as one, as one thing to be understood and not to be understood as a distinct, as distinct um, practices or distinct states of mind. 
because the process in the practice is really progressive and eventually we are aiming to achieve a certain state of mind which is no longer um, perceiving dualistic ap appearances uh, whatsoever these become completely uh, absent and this is really the objective where we're going towards uh, in the future this is where we're moving towards to rid ourselves of these dualistic appearances because once the mind is no, no longer perceives um, of an reality in a dualistic manner, then all qualities are therefore able to manifest and all faults are also able to be uh, eliminated and uh, exhausted. The main condition for dualistic appearances to arise um, or for a dualistic mind to arrive is based upon appearances um, which, um, sorry, it's based upon objects appearing to exist in an intrinsic manner. It's based upon objects appearing to exist in an objective manner. So not only are they appearing in that way, on top of that there is a belief. Yeah, there's a belief and there is thinking that those appearances are actually true. So these are the conditions which bring about a dualistic mind. And so this is why there's an emphasis here on a purifying and emptiness and remembering that emptiness doesn't simply mean nothingness. Um, it actually is referring to the lack of intrinsic existence, the lack of objective existence of phenomena. This is probably uh, why it is used here in this context. And as for these objects which uh, appear in an intrinsic manner, so there is the appearance in an intrinsic number and then there's a belief that they exist in an intrinsic manner. And the first thing we're actually going to work on and to attempt to pacify is the belief in their intrinsic reality. When our mind is uh, depressed or when we are in a moment where we feel like we're losing hope or our mind is mentally weak, we um, don't have so many uh, inner resources, um, what's happening here is that our mind is really clinging to um, uh, a reality which, exi which exists in an objective fashion. And so because there's such a strong belief that things uh, exist intrinsically, there is no way out. The mind is not able to even conceive of a way out from a situation or think of any type of solution. So in this situation, to try and move away from the state of mind and to, to think that there is a possibility, um, one needs to challenge and to reduce this belief that one has in intrinsic existence of phenomena. Alors même que l'on se sent insistant, ce qui est d'affaire, c'est heureusement d'arriver à 
deux minutes à vous dire justement cette croyance, cette saisie en fait, de notre propre existence réelle. Yo Belief in intrinsic existence really um, means a belief uh, in appearances, in solid appearances, believing in things as they just present themselves to our mind. And so this is really this belief which we're trying to pacify, which we're trying to subdue. Um, when we're talking about um, this belief in in rea in a kind of intrinsic existence, um, this intrinsic existence really or is really referring to something very solid, very uh, crystallized and kind of stuck, a stuck sort of perception of a particular object of a reality. And this belief, we're trying to wear away at it. We're trying to pacify this very solid, um, in a way, a chunky, permanent uh, thing which is before us. And to, to shift this view, uh, one brings about contemplations on the impermanent actual aspect and that this phenomena has come about based upon causes and conditions that this phenomena is a dependent arising and so it's in the nature therefore in the nature of change so although it has this solid appearance it is not actually we're shifting our belief by drawing upon these contemplations to wear away at the apparent solidity of the object or the phenomena before ourselves
When we feel down or sad or feel like we lose hope, um, it's important to remember that there is a, a path uh, to freedom. Um, it's important to understand that there is a way out from samsara, and this is very clear. The only reason why we haven't followed this path is ba basically because of laziness, um, lack of self-confidence, or uh, we uh, swayed by distractions. This is what has led us astray. But actually, there are definitely uh, there is a definite and sure path to um, rid ourselves of these uh, situations. And so, it's also what we need to do is not um, doesn't rely upon obtaining something external. We don't need to beg for this. Um, it's like you know sometimes we need to ask for permits to be able to have authorizations to do this or that. You don't need to um, to do that. You have this permit. You have this authorization already. Um, and in a sense, you have all your need to shift. The, the mind and so in a sense it's a very comfortable situation to be in just like my knee is sore and if I exercise properly and moved it properly I'm sure there would be a way to heal it and to not experience pain in my knee I'm really confident of that <laughs> <laughs> when I get up and I'm kind of swaying here and there, just make sure to hold me so I don't fall over. <laughs> it's very clear that there's a path um, to this liberation, this path to this freedom. And um, the only reason why we haven't taken them is uh, out of laziness and being completely swayed by distractions. And we get lost with these distractions. And nowadays, there's so many distractions. And I think the one of the, the worst or the strongest distraction which exists nowadays seems like it's Netflix and uh, Amazon. <laughs> and in this in these kind of sadhanas of uh, Netflix and Amazon you have the main sort of deity the Yidam becomes Jeff Bezos in that context in that tradition I guess <laughs> who, who created who um, Netflix. Who's who's the Yidam of Netflix? <laughs> and the mandala is in California. <laughs>
The point here is um, going against and wearing away at dualistic appearances and believing in these dualistic appearances. And so Tantra is really uh, focusing on this and presenting a method which is um, this inseparable method of um, wisdom and method. And this provides a very deep and clear way in order to wear away at these dualistic appearances. It's really the essential practice in Tantra. And I think it also has to do when one in the Tantra as one is working with a more subtle level of mind and as one um, gets more, um, gets into contact with this subtle level of mind, um, the realization that the path are much quicker. They happen in a much deeper and a faster fashion. And I think naturally dualistic appearances are kind of overcome or um, sort of worn away at, whereas the coarse mind is really functioning on the basis of belief of dualistic existence and du a dualistic world. It's a very strong um, appearance to the coarse level mind. Uh, 
Là, il dit on sait à Dieu. Qu'est-ce qu'il est d'accord On sait à l'occasion là. On sait à tout quoi. On a passé chez ça à quoi là. Là, il y a un mot qui a dit que ça n'est pas comme ça. Il y a un mot qui a dit que ça n'est pas comme ça. Ça n'est pas comme ça. Just like I mentioned yesterday, in the context of this specific practice of Vajrasattva, so we will proceed with uh, the foundation of all good qualities, and then we visualize. So while we're doing this, as the field of merit, which is um, visualized before oneself, and we receive the blessings from the field of merit throughout the recitation of the foundation of all good qualities, and then eventually at the end, the field of merit dissolves into us, uh, melts into light, and then on the crown of our head appears a Vajrasattva. And then the first at this point there is um before where there is this melting which is occurring there is um the the meditation which is done on emptiness and so the syllable pam appears which then transforms into a lotus which then uh, turns into the syllable a and then the syllable a uh, melts away and then there is again uh, the mind which is contemplating emptiness uh, emptiness is uh, awakened and ignited once again so one spends a bit of time at this point meditating on emptiness and then from the state of emptiness um, appears a conventional reality and the conventional reality is uh, here manifested in the form of this, of this moon disk on top of which is the syllable whom and so uh, the aspect here is of the conventional reality is uh, the syllable whom but the actual nature of what whom is it is um, the um, the profound uh, mind um, the profound and clear mind of all of the Buddhas so it's the very um, Mm, the non-dual primordial uh, bliss wisdom of all the buddhas which is the the nature which is of of whom which is and so whom is simply the aspect but then its nature is this non-dual primordial uh, union of bliss and wisdom and then uh, whom then transforms and here this transformation is pointing at as our own uh, profound um non-dual uh uh, wisdom, bliss, and so here we can also, you can contemplate it in that manner, or you can also think about the uh, inseparability of uh, dependent arising and uh, emptiness. This is what's uh, indicated here through this process. Jean-Claude, tu as 
一二三四五六七八九十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十十As a beginner, when we consider uh, engaging in these practices, uh, such as uh, uh, like following the sequence of first the syllable pam and then ah, and you've probably noticed that what I say is that you know the it in, there is the aspect uh, which is a syllable or uh, whatever form is being visualized, and then in its nature, what it is actually uh, sort of symbolizing in a sense. And so, this process of thinking of the syllable pam and the syllable ah, uh, and this creative process, this process of creative imagination, actually, I don't think it's in, it's using or activating in a sense the more subtle mind. I I think the subtle mind is really harnessed when there is this uh, moment of transformation, of shifting from one syllable to another, from one aspect to another. And this is really when the practice of wisdom is um, engaged in. And I think this means because we're engaging in the practice of wisdom in a, in a deeper way, um, the mind, which the subtle mind is also uh, activated in this sense and uh, used and drawn upon. And so the, the, the transformation goes from the syllable pam to the lotus to the mundis to the syllable hum to the vajra and so forth. So really these transformations are a very active a moment of the practice of emptiness. And this, this practice of emptiness is also a very important that it's not considering that the appearance Appearances and the emptiness are separate entities or、uh, existing in separate manners, but they're very much existing as a whole, as a one.、Uh, they're working in, a, in a sense, in communion with one another, together with one another. And this is really what the practice, I think, is probably needed here. The experience needed through these moments of transformation is this、uh, conjoinment of、uh, method and wisdom together.、Um, but really, what I'm trying to say is that these different aspects, which are visualized during these processes of creative imagination,、uh, I think have a A function to、uh, strengthen our faith,、um, but the, in order to gain access into a more subtle level of mind, I think this is really done through these processes of transformation and the practice of、uh, wisdom. It's all right. You got it. Yeah. So, after that, you get this. 
During the visualization, the syllables, um, so from Pam to Ah and eventually Hum, um, it's the important is that you think of what they are, the meaning, uh, and not be some become so focused on the aspect really of the syllable. Um, you know, whom is really the uh, bliss, uh, sorry, the primordial wisdom of the uh, non-dual mind of all the Buddhas. It's um, this profound uh, wisdom of of all the Buddhas, and so the the syllable whom is really kind of like a signpost on the side of the road. It's telling you, okay, you know, uh, coming up, you know, give up dualistic appearance in a sense. It's really a reminder in that sense. And when you reach a stop, you put your foot on the brake and you stop. And the whom is really asking you to give a break to this belief in dualistic appearances. And this is really what is important in the practice. It's not actually being so uh, focused and in a sense obsessed on the shape of the syllable or what it means. It's really the point is to shift the way you look at the world the way you see things, uh, the way you drive is important. The signposts aren't really, they're just indicative. They're just giving you some in instructions or recommendations, but they're not really the end goal in that sense. Reducing the dualistic mind and um, then uh, on that basis visualizing uh, our Vajrasattva on the crown of our head 
um, and engaging in the practice will definitely bring about a great deal of blessing and a great deal of purification. This is uh, certain. However, if we maintain a very strong dualistic mind and uh, on top of that we have quite a weak faith engaging in, you know, in these practices, uh, which would kind of result in a weak wisdom, will bring about challenges in our purification practice. There'll be some type of benefit, but um, probably, but uh, it won't be any of the benefits uh, which are exposed or presented in the literature. It's it's incomparable to what is mentioned there. Um, especially when one is engaging into in a practice of adrasatva um, and one believes in a intrinsically existing um, vajrasatva one believes in that appearance of an intrinsic um, the existing vajrasatva um, it's possible that on that basis you engage in the practice and you do have a deep and profound faith so it's possible to develop faith um, based on this view of belief in intrinsic existence. Um, but it reminds me of a sutra which was mentioned, which um, described uh, overcoming, uh, believing in intrinsic existence in a, in a self-exist, in an intrinsically existent Buddha, in an intrinsically existing Dharma, and an intrinsically existent Sangha. So this sutra really mentions um, overcoming this belief in an intrinsic existence of the three jewels. And there's a great deal of advice in relation to this. And so, if one practices with this belief that phenomena exist in an intrinsic fashion, uh, and this is, would be true for the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, one's personal uh, deity, um, I think that there, it's, there, the, the person, this individual, would just consider phenomena existing in objective fashion, that they exist by their own power. And like I said, if in relation to these practices, one has a great deal of faith. There is a possibility to accumulate a great deal of merit. However, this clinging and this belief in intrinsic existence would actually uh, bring brings about the risk of stabilizing one's own ignorance as well.
And in the context of practicing Dharma and what it actually involves, it means that we, our mind is uh, being shifted away from um, functioning in a in believing in a sense of in ordinary appearances and we're trying to make our mind more subtle, more deep. And this is true whether the practice is in the context of Tantra or whether it's in the practice of Sutra. And so the mind is trying to be shifted so it no longer engages in a dualistic way with reality. And so the purpose is, this is really the purpose of the Dharma, to reinforce the strength of the mind in order to be able to overcome a dualistic apprehension of the world. When we try and develop methods in order to be able to overcome dualistic appearances, um, Let's think about what these methods actually are. Is there any new methods? Is there any other ways of doing this which are out there? Here in the context of Buddhism and what, are the, what I'm sharing with you, it's based upon the teachings of the Buddha Bhagavan who presented in the Sutra and the Tantric teachings. You know, first you need to overcome your belief in intrinsic existence of phenomena and then you work or you work at eliminating those appearances of a phenomena existing in an intrinsic uh, or an objective way. But I'd be curious to know, you know, are there any other methods out there? Is there anybody else which has any ideas? I mean, I'm just, you know, um, yeah, kind of, I would be, I would love, you know, I'd really like to know if there are any other ways out there. But I think here in the context of France, we do need a, a Buddha, an enlightened being, which could come along and present these different methods, uh, a being which has overcome all uh, dualistic appearances. We need this uh, very, very quickly here. So it doesn't matter whether it turns out to be a, a southern French person or a northern French person, whatever. Wherever they are, it's fine.
这个特别重，近年，嗯，上当了一个，不是稀不地，不是地，这特别可能大家国民党当中跟稀不地特别关系，但是做了强烈暴力事件，稀不地特别特别关系，因为重庆人那种，很少的人多，还是。就是卡瓦，拉多卡瓦的不行啊，还是，拉多卡瓦的，哎，那是阿爹家的事吧？但那是，虽然拉多的肯定阿爹肯，不管能不能达到那个阿爹的肯定还不是。哈哈哈哈哈哈。阿爹。哈哈。那是，那是说的工地机，工地那个机器。生气的可能，他那些个一年一年没给他们，给你钱的生意，他阿爹生意阿爹说说不要不，阿爹说那个过他说他那不要不的嘛，阿哥嘞阿爹阿，阿哥嘞阿爹，别看了，阿爹阿哥嘞，几个 ？Is update and upgrade are they the same? Exactly the same? No. no. no? So Valerie is explaining the difference between update and up, upgrade and update. I appreciate. Okay. Upgrade. <laughs> 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 so, um, in the process of this practice of uh, the sadhana, um, we're training our mind um, to become more and more subtle through the process of uh, self-generation. And so, it's kind of like you become you're training your mind to become more and more subtle in a way. It's kind of like the way we update our uh, mobile phone. Um, so we have from beginning this time we've. Ha- Had the same. We've been recycling and reusing the same old coarse level mind, and this mind desperately needs an update. And so, the practice of Vajrasattva has to do with overcoming and pacifying dualistic appearance. And to be able to do this, we really need to update and actually also upgrade our mind. We need to do both. We need to update and upgrade. So first, let's do. We need to do an update by engaging in these practicing, accumulate in a vast amount of merit, and then you can really upgrade your mind. <laughs> and when you do the different visualizations from the top down, bottom up, and instantaneous, that's like a total deleting of karma. It's a wipeout. <laughs> That's what we need, no?
Here, what I'm trying to get at really is um, to rid ourselves of um, the focus should be to rid ourselves of the dualistic uh, mind, and so it means that such a mind uh, no longer sees uh, uh, there is a union which occurs between emptiness and appearances. They're no longer sort of distinct um, elements, and so this is a practice which is engaged in when we are out of session. So, by the power of the meditative practice that one has done out of session, when goes one goes round and sees birds, flowers. Uh, trees and so forth, one sees um, that there is no distinction between the appearance and emptiness. When we see the appearance, we see its emptiness. When we see the emptiness of it, we see the appearance. And so this is the non-duality, which is a uh, practice uh, outside of the formal sessions. And then during the practice, the, the inseparability is considered of the, the union or the, the communion of uh, bliss and uh, emptiness. So these are considered to be one. And so this is where the non-dualistic mind is sort of um, working in this manner during the practice. And so there are two sort of inseparabilities which are, which are um, trained in one which is during the practice and one which is done after, um, after, um, after the practice this is this union of the appearance and emptiness one sees the appearance and also sees its emptiness and through the emptiness one sees the appearance and during the practice it is the inseparability of a bliss and emptiness which are um, conceived of à amener en fait euh, notre, euh, notre esprit à, euh, au sein même, c'est-à-dire bon, pas à notre terme d'expérience, mais non, à, au sein même de, euh, de cette absence donc, de euh, dualité entre la profondeur et la clarté, entre euh, l'expérience de félicité et de vacuité, peu importe le, les aspects que vous pouvez rappeler. When one considers the other um, parts of the visualization in relation to the Vajra, which is uh, marked at its center with the syllable hum, and then there's rays of lights which come out and come and are reabsorbed, and this is repeated a couple times. This is referring to the accomplishment of the welfare of uh, both self of both self and others. <laughs> no, the other translators. <laughs> so Rinpoche says she needs she has an updated uh, maybe needs an update. 
So the two the two rays of light, which are these two phases where rays of lights are, are shine out and accomplish the welfare, the two welfares, both self and others. So this process of visualization, which I mentioned yesterday, is really the accomplishment uh, and the accumulation of merit in the sense. And the other stages in the uh, creative imagination, which are the syllable hum, uh, pam, and all these other syllables, um, I think it's really a practice which is associated with wisdom. And in that sense, the accumulation of wisdom is done. So in this way, we're able to engage in the Vajrasattva practice and to engage with it fully, one is accumulating these two, um, these two collections, uh, both the merit and wisdom. Based upon uh, this Vajra, which is on the crown of our head, which, which is then transformed into Vajrasattva with uh, one face and two arms, and he is. Um, sitting in the Vajra, post, Vajra, Vajra posture and he has all the major and minor marks of a Buddha. And so this is again the aspect yeah, which is uh, manifesting before us the appearance but the essence we could say or the nature of what it is is that Vajra said for, uh, represents or symbolizes um, the the wisdom a realizing emptiness of all the Buddhas. And so this is the this is what he truly um Mm, mm, embodies in a sense. Um, and we, it's also important to have the consideration that as uh, Vajrasattva appears, he is inseparable um, with our own uh, root uh, teacher. And so it's good if you have time in your own personal practice to uh, give yourself um, um, to spend time cultivating faith and generating single pointed faith uh, uh, on. Uh, um, Vajra Sattva, which is inseparable with our root teacher, and also remembering his its essence, which is um, the wisdom realizing emptiness of all the Buddhas. Um, 
As I'm mentioning as a faith and cultivating faith, I think it's very valuable to spend the time to um, develop it in a single pointed way because um, it enables and it will nourish your joy, it will nourish your courage, and I think it's a very uh, useful in the sense of in generating wholesome uh, mental states. Um, it tends to raise your mind up if you feel a bit down, uh, a bit um, like you're losing hope or something. Um, cultivating faith, um, simply there is the dimension of the blessing, but there is just also in the sense that the, the mechanics uh, in the sense of the mind of how it raises your minds up and it inspires you and it will really um, sort of um, get you out of these sort of um, depressed and um, um, uh, mental states. So, we'll leave it at that for today.